Hi and welcome to the Open Tech Lab. So in today's video I have a device teardown and review for you. This is the EasyCap 283S HDMI capture device. And on this channel I find myself very often needing to capture HDMI signals and encode them in video form so that I can show you things from various devices I'm demonstrating. So I've got a bit of an ongoing mission to find a decent HDMI capture device at a low cost. And so I'm really happy to say that Gearbest have sent me this little module to review and test out. So let's get the box open and have a look at what's inside. So here we've got the contents of the box, we've got the device itself, we've got a remote control, we've got an extender for the remote control, a power supply, a manual in English and Chinese, and a CD of software. Now if we have a quick look at the exterior of the device, you can see the enclosure is made of sheet metal, so very sturdy. We have an LCD status screen, we have some clicky feeling tactile control switches here, and a few status LEDs. Then if we look at the back, we can see the various inputs. We've got our DC power input, we've got our HDMI video input, and it can also take an input from analog component video and from composite video. And then we also have an HDMI output, which is useful for passing through through the HDMI input into the device capturing it but also passing it out to a TV monitor of some kind. Then if we look at the side we've got a USB port so that you can plug the device into a PC. Then on the front side we have the receiver for the infrared remote control, a jack socket for the infrared extension and I suppose this would be useful if you wanted to store the box somewhere out of the way but you still wanted to be able to control it with the remote. We have a USB host port so that you can plug a USB memory stick into it and record straight onto that. And we have a microphone input so that you can plug in an external microphone. So you don't just have to record off uh, the HDMI input, you can also record your own microphone input here, which I suppose would be really useful for recording commentary and that kind of thing. And we have a microphone volume here and also a line out so you can feed it out to some kind of monitor. And if we power the device up, you can see it comes up pretty quickly and it comes up with the date and time, which is correct pretty much within a couple of minutes, except that I think it's set to the Shenzhen time zone. Now, when it comes to the user interface, there's hardly anything to this thing. We have a record button, a button for setting the resolution, a button for setting the input source, a button for taking snapshots and the settings menu button. And within this menu, there's only two items. There's one option for setting the time and another item for setting scheduled recordings. And that's all there is. And if we exit out of this menu, we just end up at this status screen. And this only ever shows uh, the scheduled recording and the time. So it doesn't ever show any uh, information about the recording or anything like that. So here I have the TV attached as a monitor and I've got my laptop attached as a video input and I'm playing a movie here. This is Cosmos Laundromat. It's an open source movie by the Blender Foundation. And so if I go ahead and hit record, we'll be able to see how well the quality comes through. Now, if we load up the file in VLC, you can see the video stream is coming through in H.264 at 1080p at 30 frames per second. And the audio was recorded in MPEG AAC, or you might know it as M4A format at 48 kilohertz sample rate. And then if we look at the statistics page, we can see the overall data rate is about 16 megabits per second or two megabytes per second. Now, if we compare the captured video with the original, we can check the color reproduction. And from what I can tell, it's not perfect. It's not a one-to-one -one exact replica of the color, but overall the reproduction isn't too bad. I've noticed that some darker shades come through slightly less vibrant, but I don't think the effect is noticeable enough to cause a major issue for most use cases. Now in the case of long running captures, typically a device like this will divide the files up into chunks of no more than 4 gigabytes in size. And that 4 gigabyte limitation comes from the design of the Microsoft FAT32 file system, which is the de facto standard file system used in USB keys and memory cards and so on. And this device is no exception. It seems to like to divide the files if they get larger than 2.1 gigabytes in size. And uh, usually what happens is that it's the user's job to assemble the pieces back together, which is not hard to do with FFmpeg. It has features built in to allow you to concatenate the files back into one piece. 
And in my testing, I found that if you do that, it preserves every single frame of video, as far as I can tell, but it does introduce a small glitch into the audio. Okay, so now I want to test out the audio synchronization in the HDMI capture. And so to do that, I've created a test video where every single frame of the video is black, apart from one frame every second, which is white. And during that white frame, a sine wave is played that starts at the beginning of the frame and finishes at the end, and it's a 2000 hertz tone. Now, you can see the uh, white frame of this video here in the timeline of Caden Live, which is my favorite video editor, and you can see the audio represented by this little triangle. Now, this lead up here, this ramp is actually misleading. There is no ramp. It just starts, the tone starts at the beginning of the frame and it ends at the end of the frame. So if we go ahead and compare this to the captured version of the video, we'll be able to see how well synchronized the HDMI audio is with the video in the input versus the output. And if we look at the comparison, you can see that it's moved the audio ahead of the original by about a frame, about 30 milliseconds or so, which is not particularly good, although it will be easy enough to move the audio ahead by a few milliseconds to get it back in sync again if you need to. Now, I was curious if it could record HDCP encrypted content, and so I plugged in my Google Chromecast here, and it turns out if you try to do that, it doesn't record properly. The audio comes through both in the recording and on the monitor, but the video is just a black screen. Now, I'm just testing the composite input to the device, and I've got my old camera plugged into it, and as you can see, the quality is pretty poor, but to be fair to it, it's not as if I'm plugging in an HD analog input source, so it's hard to tell what it would do with a quality input source, but I don't really have one available and it's not very important to me anyway. Now, it would be nice if the device had a slot for an SD card. I prefer to record to memory cards over USB sticks. But as it turns out, you can just plug in one of these USB SD card readers and it will record onto the SD card just fine. Now I just want to check how noisy the microphone input is, so I've connected it to a silent input source and I've set the input gain to maximum. So now with that recording of silence, we can load this up inside Audacity, and because there is no audio signal on this, what we're seeing here is just the self noise of the microphone input itself. And you can see it's really very good. The only issue here is this spur that's at uh, 32 hertz at minus 71 dB, and the rest of it's just some brown noise at around minus 78 dB, so very, very respectable. And if you reduce the gain of the microphone input, this uh, brown noise will go even lower. Lower. But it's not quite as good as the performance of my Lumix G7 camera. Uh, this has a tiny bit of an offset at DC and a tiny little spur at 3 hertz, and then absolutely nothing else uh, below, above minus 90 dB. So it's pretty good, the Easy Cat, but not as good as a professional device would be. Now, one criticism I have of the design of this thing is that there is no indication of the microphone input level. And, of course, as I'm talking, I want the audio level to be sitting around minus 3 dB or so, something like that. And, of course, if I have it connected up to the PC streaming through the USB connection, and I'll talk about that feature in a minute, if I'm doing that, I will be able to have some kind of audio level readout on the PC. But if I'm recording onto USB stick, there's no indication that the level's correct. And, of course, if I want to do this, the only way to get the level correct is through a process of trial and error as I adjust this volume knob, which is going to be very, very annoying. And, of course, because there are no markings on this knob, if I find the perfect sweet spot to have the level set to, how on earth am I ever going to get it back to the way it was? I suppose I'm going to have to put some kind of marking on the plastic wheel somehow, like put a little sticker on there or something like that. I don't know. So now let's try streaming to the PC. And to help do that, they provided a CD full of drivers and if you don't have an optical drive available everything's available to download from the website and they've also provided a pamphlet of setup instructions and how to get you going streaming into OBS open broadcasting and uh, the drivers that are available are Windows only there's no support for Mac OS and no support for Linux which is what I'm using uh, but I'll talk about that in a bit more in a minute so for now I'll just see if I can get it running on Windows so here we have the stream coming through in OBS and it's all ready for me to send it off to Twitch or a YouTube live stream.
Now if we put a clock up on the laptop screen, you can see we're getting a consistent latency of about 0.5 of a second, which is pretty good. Now when you install the software for Windows, it installs a direct show device driver, which is what runs the stream from the device into OBS. And I was curious about the features of this driver, and I was curious about what options were offered in terms of different types of video streaming that the device could do. So I put in a little bit of magic into FFmpeg, and uh, this command here will get it to list out the uh, uh, options that this direct show device offers and it failed reading the options for the audio but I'm not too bothered about that I'm more interested in the video and it claims that it can stream anything from a 160 by 120 frame uh, at 0.1 fps I, I can't really see the point in that all the way up to a 480p frame at 30 fps and well, that's not a very big frame. That's certainly not 1080p HD by a long stretch. And of course, the reason for this is that the PC connection is using USB 2.0 high speed. And unfortunately, it doesn't offer a way to stream the data in compressed form into PC. The pixel format is uncompressed YUV422. And so we're getting quite a lot of data flow just to get each frame. And if you want larger frames, the bandwidth becomes so high, it's just beyond what uh, what USB 2.0 offers and if you run the stream at 480p at 30 frames per second uh, in this pixel format which of course is the only one offered uh, you're looking at a data rate of 160 megabits per second which is just about all you can expect to deliver over USB high speed so of course uh, if you wanted to get a larger frame we'd need to have a device that had either USB 3.0 super speed which would give it more bandwidth to transfer uh, all that torrent of data but what I was hoping for was that this device would have a mode where I could get it to stream into the PC in compressed form in MJPEG or H.264 or something like that. That would be perfect for my needs because I could just capture that straight into a file and divide that up to make clips for my recordings but unfortunately that just does not seem to be an offer and so as the data is completely uncompressed you're just limited to 480p which, which is quite a restriction so having spent some time with this thing i'd say it's not too bad the resolution of the video stream up to the pc over usb is a bit disappointing but if all you want to do is capture video onto a memory stick then i'd say this thing will work pretty well for that use case and if you're interested in buying one you can pick it up on Gearbest for about $100 right now and I'll link to it in the description down below. So now we've done the feature review let's get this device open and see what we can find inside. So if we start off by looking at the top side of the main board, you can see there's a variety of chips and devices dotted around this thing. But of course, the big giveaway for the core of this device is this heatsink. And whatever's underneath this thing must be doing all the work because it's producing all the heat. Now, if we have a look under the side of this heatsink, you can see the pins of this TQFP144 chip poking out with the heatsink glued on the back of it with heatsink adhesive. Now, I hope you won't be too disappointed, but I'm not actually planning to remove the heatsink. I don't have any heatsink adhesive to put it back on again, and it'll make a big mess and be a really annoying task. So I'm not planning to remove the heatsink. But in this case, it doesn't actually matter because I already know what the device under the heatsink actually is. And the reason I know it is that it comes up in the main screen when you install the driver. And the device under here is an IT9910 chip produced by ITE. Now, ITE are a fabulous chip manufacturer based in Taiwan. And if we have a look at their website, there's lots of information about their business and their various products. But for some strange reason that I don't understand, there is absolutely no information whatever, no mention at all of the ITE 9910s, which is really weird because everything else that they have on their website is mentioned in quite some detail. There's plenty of marketing material, basic overviews of what these chips do. And of course, if you want to get deeper into the technical information, you'll typically need to uh, contact them and maybe sign NDAs and such like. But I would expect some very basic information about the ITE 9910s, and it's as if they don't make them. It's as if it never existed. 
Now, as I mentioned, there is no open source driver for Linux, and I've been pondering whether it would be worth my time to go ahead and write one. And so with that in mind, I reached out to ITE to find out if they would be willing to send me any more technical information about it. And so I sent them an email, and within a couple of days, their support people replied back to me with a few interesting things. Uh, they sent me this zip file uh, labeled Linux driver. It doesn't actually do anything much other than connect to the device and debug a few things. There's this package which is a bit bigger and it contains more stuff and it's basically a test application that runs on Mac OS and I think there might be some more interesting things to learn from the source code of this thing. And then here they've sent me the spec sheet for the device and of course I would expect this to be listed in public on their website but actually uh, the version they've sent me here is uh, provided with a watermark for that says confidential for Joel Holdsworth which means that I've been given this document but I can't share what's in it with you and uh, it's unfortunate really because there really isn't anything particularly amazing within it's 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 just a basic product sheet a basic data sheet with simple information about the device and all I can say is what we already know about it from looking in the easy cap is that it's a, it's a system on chip and it has various blocks for capturing HDMI and encoding it in H.264 and it can talk USB and it's got a, a couple of processor cores built into it and so it's pretty much perfect for the job of uh, this HDMI capture device but I'm still baffled as to why they don't put this information in public. Now they did say to me that if I wanted more information then I would need to go ahead and sign an NDA and they said that I would need that in order to find out more information about the USB protocol and so I replied back to them saying well if you want me to write a Linux driver you'll you need to be aware that some of this information will go into the kernel source code and so it'll be available in public and furthermore it's not as if that uh, USB protocol is really something that's very secret because there are many ways of capturing the USB traffic uh, to reveal what it does using reverse engineering techniques and some of those I've talked about on this channel before so they should be aware that they're being very secretive about this device and I don't really see why and since I mentioned that they seem to have gone quiet on me and I don't really know what their thinking is at this point perhaps they'll reply back to me in a couple of days but as it stands the uh, communication is over so I'm not sure really what to do next. Now at this point I'm not really sure whether it's worth my time to proceed with a Linux driver for this thing because if the Windows driver is anything to go by then this device is limited to streaming at 480p and of course that limitation comes from the bandwidth of USB 2.0. Now, there may be a way to convince the device to put out an H.264 stream, and if it could be convinced to send that compressed data up to the host, then it would be possible to send the data in the full 1080p resolution. But I'm not sure how to go about doing that unless ITE can provide me with some technical information on that one. Uh, it might be possible through reverse engineering, but that would be a bunch of work to try and figure it out, I should think. And anyway, even if I could get it to put out a 1080p stream in compressed form, I'm not sure whether that would be useful as an input to OBS open broadcasting. So I'm not sure about this one. I can certainly write a driver for it that would stream at 480p uh, just by reverse engineering the protocol and for the small amount of information that ITE have already provided me with. But I don't know about whether it's possible to produce a driver that is actually useful for my needs. But if you'd like me to have a go at writing a driver and make a video about it, if you can come up with some justification as to why it might be useful, then please do leave it in the comments and I'll consider it. But of course, I've got plenty of other content to make videos about. So if it's not that interesting to you, then I'll probably go and do something else that's more productive. So anyway, if we come back to our board, we can have a look at how the video encoder chip has been wired up to everything. Now looking at this board, it's not too hard to understand, and what helps make it easier to understand is that it's a two-layer board, which means that it's really easy to see how things are wired together. But for some strange reason, they've decided to use a laser to remove the identification markings from this chip and this chip. And I really don't understand why they chose to remove the markings from these two chips and not any of the others. And as it happens, one of them has a quite obvious function because it's connected to the input HDMI connector and the data channels 
uh, are connected into it and then uh, from this chip it's connected into the HDMI input connections of the HDMI video encoder chip, the IT ITE 9910. So I really don't understand why they would need to remove the markings on this thing because it seems to me that this is probably just some kind of uh, HDMI receiver buffer chip, something like that, that's just cleaning up the analog signal coming off the wire. So why would they remove the markings? I have no idea. So when we're capturing from the HDMI input, the input signal comes in through this connector, is fed into this unmarked chip here, and then is fed into the HDMI input of our IT9910 system on chip. And then as it turns out, the system on chip has two video ports, one HDMI input and one bi-directional video port, as in it can work as both an input and an output. And in this case, it's working as an output and it's feeding the video signal, the pixel data onto this parallel bus here. And this parallel bus is wired up to this chip over here. This is an HDMI transmitter by ITE, another chip by ITE. This is the IT6613E. And in the case of this chip, there's plenty of information listed on the ITE website, including a data sheet which contains anything you could really want to know about it. It's really good. And I've provided a link to it as well as every other data sheet I could find in the show notes if you're interested in finding out more. Anyway, the job of this chip is to encode the pixel data coming out of the ITE uh, 9910 and encode it back into HDMI uh, signaling so that it can set, be sent out of the HDMI output and you can attach it to your monitor. Now when we're capturing from one of the analog inputs, the 9910 is put into a receive mode. So instead of driving pixels onto the bus, it receives pixels from the bus. Now the HDMI transmitter chip still listens on the bus for those pixels and transmits them out of the HDMI connector, which is how you can see the analog signal through your monitor. But in this case, instead of the 9910 driving it, it's one of these two chips here and here. And this one here takes the input from the composite input. This is an ADV7180B by Analog Devices. And this captures the composite signal and demodulates it into pixel data. And similarly, this chip here is a CAT9883CCQ by Chip Advanced Technology. And this contains fast ADCs for capturing the component inputs and demodulating that into pixels. So depending on which input mode we've got selected, it will either be the 9910 driving this bus or the uh, composite input chip or the component input chip, one or the other, and uh, whichever one it is will be uh, received by the HDMI transmitter so the monitor can see what the video is. Now supporting the 9910 are these two crystals, it seems to require two oscillator inputs and this little SPI flash, 32 megabits, and this would contain the firmware. Now the audio handling inside this device is a bit weird and I can't say I completely understand it, but at the heart of this de device we have three Cirrus Logic digital audio chips. We have this chip here which is a stereo audio DAC and it's used for converting digital audio signals in PCM or I2S signaling and it can convert these through into analog form and then those analog signals are connected into this amplifier arrangement here and this is used to drive the uh, outputs on this jack connector and this amplifier is needed so that it has enough power to drive headphones or whatever you want to plug into it and then we have something similar on the input side uh, connected to the microphone input we have this WM8960 audio codec, and this can convert from the analog microphone input through to I2S signaling. However, this is also a two-channel device, as in it has both an output and an input. So it can also convert from a digital audio signal through to an output. So I'm a bit confused as to why they had a separate DAC for the output. Uh, I would have thought they could have done the whole thing with this single uh, audio codec is a single uh, chip to handle both sides but obviously they had their reasons and then the I2S uh, signals connect through to this chip over here which is a Sony Philips digital interface SPDIF transceiver 
Now, SPDIF is another different audio handling format that you find inside devices. I2S is something you only find internally, whereas SPDIF, you may have used it before if uh, you've ever used it to connect together your hi-fi equipment. It's something that's used to connect audio devices together externally. So this whole thing is a bit weird. Uh, it seems to be using both I2S and SPDIF, and I'm not sure what the native format that the uh, SOC is using, and I'm not exactly sure how it's all connected together. Now I've just been having a careful look round, and it looks as if the I2S signals also go through to this little device. This is a 74HC125 tri-state quad buffer. It's a common off-the-shelf part, and a device like this is useful if you want to have multiple transmitters sharing one bus, taking it in turns, so you can turn the output on this chip on and off. So perhaps there is more I2S than I initially thought, and perhaps there are multiple chips that need to be able to uh, take it in turns to transmit I2S, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, interesting design. Then if we have a look near the display board, we've got LEDs and transistors to drive these LEDs. We've got our infrared receiver here for the remote control. Uh, we've got a real-time clock chip, a Pericom PT7C4337, which is an I2C real-time clock. And we've also got a little battery to keep the clock going even when the power's off. And uh, then here, interestingly, we've got this uh, 74HC4052, which is a four-channel analog muxer. And I'm really not sure what this is doing. Then if we have a look at the display board, there isn't much to see here apart from this little chip in the middle. This is an IAP15W413. This is a little microcontroller. It's Chinese made. I, I couldn't really find any information about it, but it appears to be, from what I can tell, a tiny little 8051 microcontroller. And the job of this device is to read in the button presses and to communicate those back to the main board and also show the uh, messages on the LCD screen. Now I'm just probing around the display board connection pushing buttons and I found that there's a certain wire that when you push a button it gets these signals driven onto it as you can see on the scope here. And I had a look further and it turns out that this wire is also wired to the infrared receiver and it's also wired through to the system on chip here. So I think the way this works is that they've got one universal way of controlling the system on chip and that protocol is the protocol used by the infrared remote. And so basically the display board here is just acting like a glorified infrared remote when you, when you push buttons and send commands. And uh, also when you do the scheduled recording, the, uh, the real-time clock chip is just down in here. And so it knows the time of day by uh, reading from the clock chip over this cable as well. And uh, then when the time of day for the scheduled recording occurs, then it just sends the infrared remote control commands through the system on chip. So really the display board is just the glorified remote control. And it also explains why the display doesn't really know anything about the system status. Uh, and it doesn't really have any settings in its menu. And it's simply because it just doesn't have any lines of communication uh, where it can find out anything about the system state by talking to the system on chip. Now you know I can't help myself when it comes to showing off SIGROC in these videos and this one's going to be no exception at all. So I'm looking once again at that quad tri-state buffer, the one that's on the reverse side of the board that has the digital I2S audio signals coming into it. And for this example I've attached a Sailey clone logic analyzer to it on the right here and I've got my phone playing some audio. This is the BBC shipping forecast feeding into the input. And what we're going to do is capture some I2S signals and have a look at how they work. And then we'll see if we can decode them. So here I am inside SIGROC Pulse View, and as you can see, I've captured some I2S signaling for us to have a look at. Now, I2S is a three-wire interface, and so I've enabled three channels on the logic analyzer, and I've set it to capture 10,000 samples at 12 mega samples per second. So if I zoom in on the capture, we can have a look at what we've actually got here. So along the top row, we've got a bit clock signal, and in this case, it's running at just over three megahertz, which is why we have uh, a regular pattern of glitches in this because that uh, 3 megahertz signaling it's not quite 3 megahertz and so it doesn't exactly line up with the 12 megahertz sample rate of the logic analyzer and so we get a little glitch every so often 
And in the middle row, we have a word select, and this indicates the beginning and end of each data word. And it also indicates whether that data word is for the left audio channel or the right audio channel, depending on whether it's high or low. And at the beginning of each of these pulses, uh, the rising or the falling edge, right after that, we have the most significant bits transmitted on the data wire at the bottom. And then right at the end of these pulses, we have the least significant bit. So in the case of this word here, we have a run of zeros and then a few ones and then a few zeros at the end. So in this system, each single word, each single audio sample is 32 bits in length. So as you can see, I squared S is really very simple. Now to help us understand the meaning of these sample words, we can use Sigrox's I squared S decoding feature. So I'll just go ahead and add the I squared S decoder. And as usual, I've set the names of the various channels and so it decodes them automatically. And we can see all the values of the sample words being decoded here. But to really show off what this decoder can do, we need a much longer capture. And so here I've set the logic analyzer to capture 500 million samples, which will give us 41 seconds of captured signaling. Now, unfortunately, I can't demonstrate this feature to you inside the Sigrock PulseView graphical user interface because it hasn't been implemented there yet. So I've saved off the captured data into a file so that we can run it through Sigrock CLI. So let's go ahead and do that. So I've got Sigrock CLI and I'm going to take the input from the captured file that I just made and I'm going to use the I2S protocol decoder. Now typically you'd have to follow up by specifying which inputs uh, come from which channels but because those channels in this file have already been given the names that match the inputs to the I2S decoder I don't actually need to specify those I can just do this and if we go ahead and run that you can see we get a whole spew of hexadecimal sample data coming out but what I'd really like to show off is this feature so if I specify the dash B flag this allows us to have a binary output and I'm going to say I2S equals WAV, which will generate a Microsoft PCM WAV file. So let's go ahead and uh, pipe that into audio.wav. And uh, this will take a little while to run. Uh, Sigrock, uh, LibSigrock decode is not the fastest thing in the world. I have been working on one or two patches to improve its speed, but uh, it's still pretty slow running because it has to jump in and out of Python quite a lot. So I'm going to come back in a few minutes and we'll see what we've captured. So a few minutes have passed and here I am now in Audacity and I've loaded up the resultant file and as you can see we've got the captured wave data that we read off the wire with the logic analyzer and you can see it's come through in perfect digital fidelity and all we have to do now is try playing it. North Foreland to Selsey Bell. Southerly becoming cyclonic later 4 or 5 increasing 6. Occasional squally rain later moderate or good. Well that's about it for this video. I hope you found it interesting. Do leave your comments down below. I'm interested to see what you think and I want to give a big thank you to all my Patreons who are supporting the channel. I really appreciate it and I also want to thank Gearbest for sending us this device to review. So thank you very much for watching and hopefully I'll see you next time on the Open Tech Lab.